Hello, everybody. Uh, yesterday we had uh, the greatest, the first session about the, our the Silicon Valley Star Forum. Today we are going to having the second sessions, and then this this forum is hosted by the the Kais College of the Business. Um, my name is Do Jun Lee. I'm the professor in the Kais College of the Business, and the Silicon Forum is uh, to be invited. 10 great speakers from the, the uh, Silicon Valley and the Europe and in Korea. And then the, we are going to, to listen to the, their experience about the startups. And we are going to learn how to do start the startups successfully. And we hope that the, our professors and the students and our alumni will listen to the, this lesson and then the get us some insight how to do the startups successfully. And then I will introduce the speakers. And the, 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 the chairman, Kamran Elahain, is a legend. He co-founded more than 10 companies, and then six of them made the exit, and then three of them became the unicorn company. The, the market worth is about more than $8 billion. And the, currently, he's the founder and the chairman of the Global Innovation Catalyst. And the, he's uh, advised various government on the needed transitions from the fossil-based economies to sustainable innovation economies. In the past, as a global high-tech entrepreneur, he co-founded about 10 companies, as I said. And then the, he's now the chairman of the Global the Catalyst Partners. And this firm is about managing $350 million. And he's investing US and Japan, China, and India, and Israel, and Singapore. And the Mr. Elahain on the Mass of the Engineering degree from the University of Utah. And he began his journey as a serial entrepreneur. And he founded, co-founded the Cirrus Logic and the Leo Magic. And those companies are now very famous in the Silicon Valley. And then I hope that the, we have the Mr. Elahain has his lecture on the topic of the entrepreneurship and the innovation economy. And then we will get some valuable and something we can share together. So I will introduce Chairman Carmen Elahain. Okay, so Chairman, Merci go Professor ahead. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Merci, Professor Lee, for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, uh, you have been uh, very kind uh, with uh, giving me all of uh, credits. Uh, however, I would like to say that out of the 10 companies that I created, uh, while six of them were successful, uh, three of them also failed. Uh, and for a while, I carried uh, the title of the guy who I had uh, the biggest failure in Silicon Valley. Uh, I, uh, uh, I learned a lot from my failures and it is very important to remember uh, that in the world of entrepreneurship, um, you have to take chances and uh, don't look at failure as uh, something that uh, is uh, terminal. Uh, look at it as a step stone towards success. Uh, in uh, my definition of success, it's a management of failure. And if you learn how to manage your failures and uh, look at them as learning and improving your uh, behavior, uh, that is how you become uh, successful. But uh, let me talk about innovation economy. Uh, can you see the screen properly? Oh, I, we cannot see. Can you check it? Uh, it? It doesn't show up yet. Yeah. Okay. Let me make sure that uh, I go back and share it again. Good thing I check. Okay. It's coming up. Yeah, it's good. Okay, good. All right. First, uh, let me introduce the innovation economy. Uh, 
because it is uh, something that uh, we have uh, uh, coined and I think it's uh, important to understand about it because it is uh, uh, so fundamentally different than anything else that uh, uh, we uh, have uh, been introduced to. And then I will talk about uh, entrepreneurship within innovation economy and how entrepreneurial mindset uh, really uh, sets you apart for uh, being successful in the innovation economy. Uh, already, uh, uh, Dr. Rhee uh, introduced me, so I will not go over uh, this slide. Uh, but uh, let's talk about uh, various kinds of economies in uh, evolution of our species. Uh, our first economy after we left the caves was agricultural economy uh, that uh, started about uh, uh, 12,000 years ago. And uh, it uh, allowed us uh, to uh, leave the cave and create our own crops. And uh, we created the village and then later on the towns and later on uh, bigger towns and cities. In the 18th century, we moved to industrial economy and we learned how to use mechanical devices, steam engine, uh, to uh, actually uh, increase our productivity. Uh, 20th century brought us the knowledge economy and that this was uh, quite an inflection point because for the first time, it allowed women to have a, a major uh, position in creation of an economy and in creation of wealth for their families, for their society, for their nation, and for the world. Uh, before knowledge economy, uh, you had to have a bigger physical strength that uh, men dominated those economies. With knowledge economy, women had equal chance and we saw them participate greatly. Around 20 years ago, it was uh, with the emergence of uh, broadband, high-speed broadband internet, uh, we entered a new era, the innovation economy. And this is just the beginning of this. The last 20 years have been amazing, but uh, what we have seen is nothing compared to what is going to be ahead of us. So let's learn a little bit more about innovation economy. Many times people say, what's the difference between innovation economy versus knowledge economy? Knowledge economy was about coming up with great ideas, memorizing many, many things, keeping our ideas secret, applying for patents, and keeping a lot of trade secrets. Because knowledge was scarce and only people who had access to greatest libraries, the best books, really had a chance to become the beneficiaries of that economy. With the emergence of broadband, the knowledge of the world was distributed, was diffused all over. So having an idea was not as important anymore as how to go and implement and execute that idea. To give you an example, if we look at search engine, the greatest search engine company in the world is Google. But was Google the first company that had the idea behind the need for a search engine? Actually, no. Before Google, there were companies like Infosic, Excite, Alta Vista, Ask Jeev, Yahoo, uh, Alta uh, Vista, I think I mentioned that, at least six or seven companies. It was Google who implemented and executed that better than any of them. 
So in innovation economy, idea alone does not have much value. It would be interesting to share an experience I had with the Minister of Education of one of the countries who was telling me that they had closed down the internet for a day in their country. And I asked them why. And he said that they had national exams for high school graduates to take this national exam for entrance to university. And he said that we had to turn off the internet because if we didn't do that, our students were going to use Google, search for the answers, and it would be cheating. That's why we had to close it down. And my simple question to him was, what is the value of that education that you give to your students if somebody with access to Google within five minutes can have that knowledge? And why are you not letting your students use their mobile phone, their laptops to search for the answers? Because in real world, learning how to share ideas and finding people who can help us implement them is what is really important. Now, we said that knowledge economy was the domain that allowed women to have an equal chance. Innovation economy, as we are going to discuss more, is about changing business model, disrupting the old way of doing things and doing it in a new way. If you look at the history, how Amazon disrupted the book distribution channels, how iTunes and Spotify and Pandora disrupted and destroyed the music stores. Remember, we used to have this fantastic, beautiful Virgin uh, uh, Records uh, music stores. You would go there and listen to CD and uh, buy a CD. All of those disappeared. How Netflix and uh, Hulu and YouTube destroyed the business of video rental. Innovation economy basically has figured out how to disrupt and change the business model that has been existing in every sector and coming up with a new way. We can talk about how Uber and Grab and um, DD and all the ride sharing thing have disrupted and destroyed the taxi business in so many countries. Uh, we can talk about how the emergence of uh, the Starlink program, the low orbit satellite that SpaceX is doing, is going to disrupt the business of all the telecom. Telcos, the telecom companies, the mobile operators are all going to be significantly disrupted. Imagine if SpaceX, through their Starlink program, by launching low orbit satellites, which already they have launched and installed 1,700 of them, they could provide several hundred megabits per second connectivity all over the world and do everything IP based. Who would want to pay for data or voice to any telco? That's the power of innovation economy. Now, about 40 years ago, I came up with this chart that really said how you can create value by using the tools that might be available to you. As you go up, 
through this pyramid and use the tools at the higher levels of that, your productivity goes up and you can create value at a higher speed. Let's look at this in a couple different segments and see how it applies. About five years ago, I was doing a workshop with chief economists in World Bank, and I showed them this and how it works in the field of finance. Here is doing finance manually. This is mechanically. Here is electromechanical. Microelectronics, the calculators, revolutionized the world of finance. But it was really the spreadsheet software that changed it completely. However, if you want to be a player in the future of finance, you need to learn about algorithmic content. Blockchain, distributed ledger, cryptocurrencies, the world of finance has gone through phenomenal change, and this is just the beginning. And don't be surprised if cryptocurrencies that are based on stable uh, coins become the global currency of the whole world, not just belonging to one or two countries. This applies to every field. We looked at finance, but since we are talking about education, and I'm talking to a fantastic institution like KAIST, it would be good to look at how this pyramid applies to the field of education. When education was manual, you had to be a member of a royal family or part of a big, powerful religious organization to have access to the books which were handwritten. With the invention of Gutenberg printing press, which was a mechanical tool, it changed the world of education and the books became available to millions of people. When electromechanical printing press was invented, the newspapers, started to come and reach billions of people. But it was with the arrival of microelectronics and computers and laptops that actually you could put a thousand books, 10,000 books on a laptop. And it disrupted the need to go to a library. Just think about when was the last time that you went to the library. Why would you want to go to library? You can actually have the books on your laptop or do a Google search and read any article that you want. Either download it through Amazon or other uh, uh, services or go and read it on the PDF format in many different websites for free. Education software revolutionized the whole field of education. Online courses started to appear and the COVID had a huge impact on this. And they became very, very popular. But if we want to look at where is the future of education, already because of availability of broadband, every book, every article, Every podcast, every vlog, blog is available out there and we can go and learn on our own. The basics of an educational institution is changing. Instead of institution having a teacher give a lecture in front of a live audience, it is going to be based on learning, experiential learning, and the teacher acts more like a coach that gives workshops, problems to solve to students, and guides them 
to go through this path of how they can actually go and select what they need. And more pioneer teachers start to use various algorithmic content with recommendation engines and AI to help themselves in guiding their students. So world of education is going away from teaching to experiential learning. And that's a huge, huge impact. Many times when I listen to World Economic Forum talking about fourth industrial revolution, I agree with them that is happening, but it's not just industrial revolution. It is affecting industry for sure, but it is affecting governments, how they are going to govern. Innovation economy is affecting academics, how the K-12 or universities higher education are going to operate. Innovation economy is touching and disrupting everything. And as we start to really apply this to every sector, everything we do, whether it is world of finance, real estate, education, uh, world of uh, transportation, uh, energy generation, anything that we apply this, we will see that this pyramid works. So over time, the pyramid is going to, has already become an inverted pyramid and the jobs of future, very few of them are manual, mechanical or electromechanical jobs. The jobs of future are software and algorithmic content and learning how to use those tools effectively on value creation. Now, this is not theoretical. Let's look at the top 10 highest value companies in 2009. They were Exxon Mobile, PetroChina, Walmart, China Mobile, Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, ICBC, Johnson & Johnson, AT&T. 10 years later, they were Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent. New ones, all software and algorithmic content companies. And this is just the beginning. Of course, we will have temporary uh, changes right now because of uh, disruptions and the COVID effects uh, in our uh, supply uh, chain, uh, some resurgence on uh, price of oil and gas has come and uh, oil companies have started to have values, uh, high values, and it would be the case probably for a couple more years. But writing is on the wall. If you look at with how many companies have announced uh, electronic vehicles and how many uh, companies have committed not to make combustion engine. The world of transportation is going to become all electric. And you look at Tesla, which pioneered this, has already been worth or close to or over a trillion dollars. And it's not just because it is an electronic vehicle. Every Tesla has got these sensors that collect the data and has very powerful software with connection to the cloud that allows them to capture gigabits of software globally per second and load it up on cloud about the road conditions, about the construction, about traffic conditions, safety, all sorts of other things that allows Tesla to become a leader in 
self-driving cars that are approaching us next. Now, it used to be that if you wanted to innovate, you had to come to Silicon Valley. For me, I was born in Iran, but I had to come to the United States to study here, and I had to come to Silicon Valley to start my first company. In 1980, I started my first company. However, not anymore. This slide is actually a couple years old. It shows you the global unicorns. And you see that you don't need to come to Silicon Valley or you don't need to come to the United States anymore to create a unicorn. They have started to appear first in Europe and Asia and now in Middle East and Africa. And the effects of COVID-19 have been the acceleration of the adoption of technology in telemedicine, in teleworking, in teleeducation. So what we see has been just the beginning and it's just going to become exponential growth on having innovation economy disrupt everything. At Global Innovation Catalyst, we have a big vision. How can we use the tools that we have in Silicon Valley so that we could educate, help young people all over the world learn about innovation economy, learn about entrepreneurial skills to help create 10 million innovation jobs, 10 million jobs of future. How to help bring Silicon Valley knowledge, know-how in experiential learning methods to the rest of the world. That's our goal. And if you want to look at jobs of the future, you have to have some hard skills and some soft skills. As we said, the top of the pyramid is about software and about algorithmic content. Many, many universities, many high schools all over the world are teaching software. So I'm not gonna talk about that. But in terms of algorithmic content, a company that I really like, and I have had the honor and pleasure to be their founding investor, is called Polyon. It teaches young children from kindergarten to 12th grade how to create their virtual worlds, their virtual cities, virtual drones, virtual robots, become creative, apply the computational thinking algorithmic thinking, design thinking, to design their own world. And while they do this, they earn poly coins. Instead of having somebody mine for cryptocurrency, the poly up youth, they actually solve problems of the world, and by innovating, they earn polycoin. And if they develop their uh, virtual drones or virtual robots, which are used by other people, the more they are used, the more they earn new coins. So it's a whole new way for the youth to learn about innovation, Polyop has its own innovation hubs. We actually talk about it as like Y Combinator for K-12. Allows young people to create their virtual corporations and learn how to solve problems and take their ideas into reality. 
Very, very exciting company. The university of the future should be different than the traditional university. Traditional university has College of Engineering, College of Business, College of Design. Advanced universities bring all of these together as a tech hub within the campus. They allow the engineering school, business school, creative designers, artists come together in tech hubs. They create co-working spaces, incubators, accelerators, and let them learn by working together, learn how to collaborate with each other. If you only have engineers learn how to innovate, they might make amazing innovations that cannot be sold because regular engineer may not know the unit economics of their inventions. If you bring business knowledge into engineering schools and help them learn about product marketing, market segmentation, product development, all the things that are important for an engineer who wants to develop a new company, then you could have quite a successful company like Microsoft. However, if you remember Microsoft, you had to just get Windows start. You had to do control, alt, delete. Three fingers you had to put down to get Windows started. You might say, why? Who was the genius who thought of that? Why shouldn't it be so easy as an Apple iPhone? An iPhone, you just tap on a screen, it recognizes your face, and bang, the computer starts working. The reason is Apple brought the creative art knowledge. Steve Jobs himself had studied calligraphy, and he understood that the products had to look good and also be easy to use. So these are the three key ingredients that we need to bring people together to share with each other. Now, some universities in some countries recognize this and they create these tech hubs within their university. Some of them like Stanford actually teach business courses within engineering schools. Stanford has been doing it for more than 30 years. But in many countries, ministries of education do not understand this and they are creating traditional universities. However, there is a movement by the private sector or some of the municipalities, the city mayors or some of the state governors who create these tech hubs as part of the private sector or private public cooperation. In Africa alone, there is over 600 tech hubs all over Africa. There is an organization called Afri Labs that they have had the privilege of attending and speaking in their conferences. Afri Labs already has close to 300 members from all these different tech hubs from all these different African countries. They just had their annual gathering, their 10th annual gathering last week. And it was joyful to watch how amazing this organization has become and how it has helped create a new Africa by working with the young people who are very innovative. But it's not just Africa. This is a partial list of Middle East. You look at countries like Egypt, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Kuwait, Jordan. This is a very small list of the tech hubs, innovation hubs within all of these countries. 
So the world is changing and it's recognizing that they need to create universities of future by creating these tech hubs and teaching people by letting them learn by experiencing themselves. Experiential learning happens at the tech hubs. Now, what are the soft skills that you need to move from a fixed mindset to an innovation entrepreneurial mindset? Fixed mindset, you're afraid of change. Innovation mindset, you strive for change. Here you have fear of failure. Here you look at it as step stone to success. Single tasking, multitasking. Fear of feedback, feedback helps you grow. Jealous of other success, innovation mindset is inspired by other people's success. You don't win by putting people down. You help everybody rise up. You just work harder to rise up above them. Keep ideas secret with innovation mindset. You share and learn to collaborate. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at this, no wonder it's the young people who like change, who are not so scared of failure because they don't have much to lose. They're just young. They're just finishing high school, finishing university, starting to go to the job market. And that is why innovation economy is driven by young people. And the countries that have a lot of young people are going to have amazing assets. Another thing you can look at this, when we see things like multitasking, when you look at share and learn to collaborate, these two things, it is an interesting thing to look at. Let me tell you a little bit of my own history. When I was young, when I was a kid, all I had to do was be a good student and be a good boy. Do good at school and don't bother my parents. However, my sister, who was only three years older than me, she had to do good at school, be a good girl, but also she had to take care of me and take care of my younger brother. So she learned multitasking. And she also had to help my mom with shopping and help my mom with cooking. So she learned from a young age the skills of how to share her work, what she had to do, and learn to collaborate and ask her friends, other people to help her multitask. So in many societies, the young girls and women learn quicker than young boys how to do multitasking and how to share ideas, talk to other people, and learn to collaborate. Which says that in innovation economy, that is an added advantage for women. Female entrepreneurs have a great chance to rise up and create new heights in innovation economy. So remember again, innovation economy is driven by youth and especially creates amazing opportunities for women entrepreneurs. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. And a huge mindset 
of an entrepreneur is not to see yourself as a victim. Don't say, oh, my government didn't do this. My boss didn't do that. My company didn't do this, so I'm a victim. Look at it and say, how could I use the power of technology? How could I use innovation tools, innovative thinking to change the world and make it a much better world for all of us? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I, th this was uh, the very fantastic uh, the speech. Okay, the, the chairman, uh, we had uh, some of the questions and uh, I got uh, before the, the meeting, so the, I'll ask you some questions so you can give us uh, some the great mind. Okay, answers. hopefully not very difficult questions. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I think uh, the, the, based on the, your experience and the, your insight, I think uh, the, it's not going to be that hard. <laughs> okay. No, I'm more... always afraid about uh, being uh, uh, tested by a fantastic professor like yourself. No, not I was at all. Not a very good student. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll give you the my questions at the end of the these sessions. <laughs> okay, uh, what are the main success factors for the development of the innovative startups? Uh, in my opinion, the most important thing is the team. Uh, first of all, when you are looking to uh, start a company. Learn that it's not one person game. It is a team game. And if you recognize early on that you need to have a powerful team, then your ch the chances of success are greatly increased. One person can only do so much, but if you have two, three, four co-founders, they can help you achieve much higher results. Now you might say, what type of people do I need to bring in my team? My answer would be, first of all, you need very honest people because every startup is going to have many, many problems. And you need honest people to tell you as soon as they find a problem, let you know. The sooner you find out what are the problems that you have, you can fix it. There is never a situation that startup goes up in a smooth way. It is lots of ups and downs, lots of problems. The sooner you know that there is a problem, then you can fix it and go up again. Otherwise, you don't know and you fail. So you need to surround yourself with honest people who tell you, Hey, friend, we have a problem. Then you need intelligent people. Intelligent people love to solve problems. For them, it's fun solving problems. So look for people who are smarter than you. One of the key reasons for my success was always everybody in my team was much smarter than me and knew a lot more in everything. My job was just like a coach. If you look at the coach of a uh, sports team, whether it's football, basketball, anything, the coach doesn't do hardly anything. All he does is puts the team together, finds out what are the problems, and helps the team solve it and move forward. 
Very good. Another <laughs> key thing is learn that when you find a solution, it takes a long time. So hire people in your team that do not give up easily. Thomas Edison figured out that if you put electricity going through some filament, it could create light. But he wasn't able to achieve it first day, second day, fifth day, tenth day, hundredth day. It took hundreds and hundreds of trials with many different elements till he finally was able to make one that works. So you need resilience, the people who do not give up easily. And you also need to hire people who like to work together as a team. Because when a team member says that we have a problem, there has to be trust and people work together to solve that problem. And many times when you are ready to give up, if you have a good team, they come and tell you, no, 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 let's work together. We can find an answer. That's great. I think uh, the, the based on the, my experience too, I mean, the, this is the key. I mean, the, even you have a very nice ideas, without uh, the great team, you cannot succeed. Okay, second question is uh, uh, how to develop creativity and the innovation of the pupils and the students' entrepreneurs? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, if you create these take ups and get the people to come and get them to start to think whatever, how big their idea might, might be, get them to start to work on it. And through this process, they learn how to find and attract co-founders. They learn how to work together to solve problems. And if anything, when you go through entrepreneurial experience, you learn a lot in a very short period. My first job, I was at uh, Hewlett Packard for a couple of years. I worked at HP and all my contacts were with engineers because I was an engineer, an engineering manager. I only met engineers. But when I started my first company, within first six months, I learned about marketing, about sales, about organizational development, human uh, resources, finance, so many things. Because I had to learn, we didn't have many people to do those things in a startup you have to do many things with your small team. So as a minimum, startup teaches every student a little bit about what is marketing, what is engineering, what is sales, what's manufacturing, what is finance, what is organizational development. And you don't need to blindly follow a decision that you had made when uh, you were 15 years old, 16 years old, or 18 years old, and you decided that you are going to be an engineer, or you are going to go to school of business, or you are going to go to school of art, or school of literature. You have a chance to get practical experience in many different fields, and decide. You may not be the best engineer. You might be much better in sales. You might be much better in finance. You could be amazing in marketing. When you work in a startup in a very short period, three months, six months, you get exposure to so many things you learn about yourself. I learned, for example, that I'm not a good CEO. After I learned that, I refused to be CEO of any company. I learned that I was much better as a chairman and I could 
bring and attract powerful CEOs who knew it much better than I did. And that's how I was able, in 2000, I was chairman of six companies at the same time. Two of them were public companies. Not because I was good, but I had learned that how to recruit a good team and how to recruit a good CEO. So I learned about myself. And that's a very important thing to do at a young age. Okay. So the, your, your, your suggestion is uh, let the students uh, have uh, some kind of the startup experience when, exactly. when they are in the school. So if exactly. The, mm -hmm, okay. So and, I mean, and let them learn what is sales, what is marketing by mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. And when I teach entrepreneurial courses, I give people, uh, typically my courses are uh, three weeks long. In three weeks, I, every 24 hours, I ask them, you have to develop your team, go and recruit them. 24 hours later, I say, as a team, come up with a name, come up with a logo. 24 hours later, develop your website. And what is amazing is they learn how to do these things in a very short period of time. Because as a student, you have amazing energy and a lot of intelligence. When you go and enter the workforce, they train you to just think one way and follow what the boss says. If you go and become entrepreneur at young age, I'm not saying everybody should be entrepreneur. I'm not saying everybody should be CEO. No, not at all. It would be a very sad society if everybody was a CEO. <laughs> Who would do the work? <laughs> it is an, an amazing experience for a student to learn a little bit about many, many different fields and learn how to select a career path based on the real interest. Some things we are good at, but we don't like to do. Some things we like to do, but we are not good at. Some things we love to do, and some things we hate. The most successful people are the people who go and find something that they love and they are also quite good at it. When Michael Jordan was trying to do both basketball and baseball, he was a failure. But when, because he was, he loved both of them. He was very good in basketball, but not so good in baseball. When he threw away baseball and concentrated, on basketball, he became number one in the ball because he learned to do something that he loved and he was also very good at it. There is a famous saying that says, if you love what to do, if you love what you do, you never have to work another day of your life. Your work is your vacation. <laughs> I used to say to my, my the, the people who work with me. <laughs> okay. Well, well that's uh, the reason I will never retire. I love <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> that, that, that's uh, your, 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 basically your hobby. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. And uh, the third one question is, uh, the there's the emergence of the new technologies, create new market niches for the development of the innovative startups? Uh, of course, as uh, I mentioned on showing you that pyramid, uh, you can look at that pyramid and keep track of what is development on any field that you are interested. 
if you go and look at any company, if you look at any uh, market, and you see that people are still using pencil and paper, you know that you can introduce new technology there. If people are not use, using mobile phones, you know you can use, bring new uh, uh, technology there. If they are not using blockchain, you know that uh, there is a new way to do it. If they are not using big data, they are not using artificial intelligence, you know that there is a way to disrupt that market. Whether it is a medical market, whether it is a service market, whether it is insurance, whether it is auto sales, I don't care, whatever you look at. Okay. Uh, the first one is, what is and how to analyze the difference between startup and the technology entrepreneurship? Well, startup is something that somebody creates out of nothing. And entrepreneurship is, again, creating something out of nothing. Now, when you are doing this, you can use technology to make your startup be stronger. I mean, look at it this way. If you come and say, okay, I want to deliver a uh, pizza to you, uh, hot, fresh, out of the oven pizza. Uh, if you use the manual technology, you would say that, uh, okay, you have to come uh, to my store and uh, order it. Or uh, you can say, uh, you can call me and uh, I will uh, uh, make the pizza and I walk to your home. That might take me one hour or two hours. If you use a motorcycle, you could be faster. Uh, if you use a uh, race car, you could get there a lot faster. If you use a drone, you could get there a lot faster. So technology plays a way as a tool and that you could use uh, to make pizza delivery better. And if you use an easy app that people can order, and if you keep track of big data of what type of things people order at what time of the day, you can always have ingredients at hand and if you learn how to use the big data to analyze their behavior, you can figure out how many drivers you need, how many uh, places you need uh, in terms of having ovens, and what would be the quickest way to get the pizza delivered to the person. It may not be from your uh, headquarters. It might be from your shops, which is closer uh, to my home. So it is use of technology that allows you to provide a situation for a successful startup. And my expertise has always been on how to use innovative technology to make a startup successful. Now, a startup could be uh, a, uh, you know, mom and uh, uh, pop type of store that somebody starts it, but it's not really a startup because it cannot be scaling up. It's not using new technologies, the traditional way that a husband and wife uh, open up a restaurant, for example. Uh, that, I don't call it a startup, it's a uh, uh, small business, traditional business. But when you use the leverage of technology, then it becomes startup. Okay. And uh, the, last, the, the next one is uh, uh, a year into the pandemics. How have the science and technology in the world been impacted? And uh, how do you think about it? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, because of COVID, because of pandemic, people started to 
develop the skills to use technology very quickly. I mean, a technology like what we are using right now for video conferencing, this is not something new. Uh, in 1990, uh, I would say 1996 or seven, uh, we set up video conferencing equipment in uh, uh, one of my companies. Uh, but we hardly ever used it because every time we wanted to use it, we had to have an IT expert come and set everything up and all the protocols to make it work. However, because of COVID, the need became so high that companies like Zoom came along that everybody learned how to use it. My mom, who is 95 years old, she uses Zoom. So COVID allowed the people to change behavior and learn how to communicate using technology. And as I discussed, this effect was in education, it was on medicine, health, on, uh, uh, on uh, work. Many companies right now in uh, Silicon Valley or all over the world uh, are giving a choice for their employees to work remotely. The talk about uh, remote work uh, was discussed for 40 years. It was COVID that made it become possible. And people said, oh, actually productivity is quite good. Maybe instead of requiring our employees to come to work every day, we have them work from home. They save the commute time. And maybe once a week or twice a week, we ask them to come and meet together in a conference room. And that has implications. Many corporations do not need the big buildings. They don't need the fancy, huge offices. People work from home, but maybe these new services that provide you either many, many small conference rooms that the teams can go and work, or big lecture halls that uh, a big team can come together and have an event together. From me, for me personally, obviously for about a year and a half, I didn't travel at all. So COVID had a huge uh, impact on grounding me. I used to travel three weeks every month. But as of June, I got vaccinated. I'm actually uh, triple vaccinated, got my booster shot uh, two months ago, three months ago. And uh, I've been traveling. Uh, I mean, for two and a half months, I was traveling in Thailand, in Sweden, in Denmark, in France, in uh, Germany, in uh, uh, Spain. So for me, life has become normal. Uh, you obviously have got to uh, follow a few more procedures, like uh, have your test and have your mask and those kinds of things. But uh, life has started to go back to normal but it really allowed two things to happen. One is people started to adopt technology much faster. It accelerated that. And second thing was a very interesting phenomenon. If you look at when we were, our species came along, we used to work in uh, caves. We used to live in cave, work in cave. And uh, we only uh, trusted immediate family, 20, 30 people who were with us in cave. When we developed agriculture technology, we created the village. And we started to trust and cooperate with 200 people, 300 people, 500 people in a village. As we developed the coins and the uh, carriages, uh, the wheel, we started to build towns uh, that had a few thousand people and cities which had a, a few hundred thousand people. And so evolution of our species used the technology to have peace within bigger number of people. And uh, when uh, uh, the concept of country came along, the people who recognized it went and colonized 
the rest of the world that, that were still in the tribal base. And then a couple hundred years ago, we created the first uh, Uber country, with super country, which was the United States. 50 states came together. And in 1992, we had EU created uh, that uh, uh, so many European countries, uh, more than 30 of them, came together now, have come together and created EU. But around four years ago, or five years ago, uh, there was a setback to this uh, evolution of our species. Uh, I mean, you didn't need to be uh, Einstein to figure out the future of humanity is global cooperation, and you needed to work uh, uh, together as a uh, cooperative uh, earth. Uh, we created, as I said, United States, EU, then EU and US uh, created a positive relationship with each other, then uh, in cooperation with Japan, with Korea, uh, with uh, many countries in the uh, uh, Middle East. Uh, they formed uh, other relationships and it, a few billion people have agreed to work together. Even in Africa, African Union started and now has a uh, uh, some like the 30 members or more uh, that are uh, uh, pledging to work together and not fight with each other. But as I said, five years ago, this trend stopped and we started to have these crazy ideas that I don't care about the rest of the world, America first or uh, uh, Brazil first or India first uh, or... Uh, uh, hungry first, uh, you know, some uh, uh, leaders came and said that uh, uh, we only do what is good for our country. And if in the process we destroy the rest of the planet, that's okay. Well, this kind of thinking was uh, taking us back towards cave. And uh, COVID uh, showed us that uh, uh, the viruses do not respect the walls. Uh, you cannot build walls and separate people. Uh, the virus spreads everywhere and it allowed us to start to push us actually to work together, to develop vaccines together, to distribute it together and uh, for people to stop thinking selfishly that I only care about my country. Uh, I think it's uh, very important as we are having more and more people uh, go and uh, to outer space and look at our planet uh, from outside, they will see that on the planet Earth, there is no line separating uh, uh, say, Korea from China or separating the United States from Canada or from Mexico. Uh, there is no border and all of them are connected together. I was born in Iran and if you look at from space station to Iran, there is no line between Iran and Turkey, Iran and India or Pakistan. All of these are connected together. You cannot even find your country easily. So the future of evolution of our species is the whole planet has got to become the united planet of Earth. And COVID told us how dependent we are. And right now, some of our supply chain problems tells us that we all need each other and we all need to learn how to work together. And this is a very, very important thing in evolution of our species. Very nice. Okay, I have a, a couple of questions from the YouTube. And the first one is, uh, what are your opinions in the role of the R&D in the innovation economy? Well, you can't have innovation without R&D. Uh, there is uh, research, long-term research that uh, is done by 
some big corporations or some uh, government institutions. Uh, but more and more people are recognizing that to make the development side of that happen, we need new techniques. One of the things that everybody has to learn is instead of locking yourself up in a research facility and uh, thinking that you should do research and develop something that might be useful to human beings, it's much better to quickly develop a simple prototype and go out there and test it. You might be surprised that what you think the world needs is different than what actually is needed out there. So it's very important to look at rapid prototyping as a part of R&D. Don't do research in vacuum. Go and develop something quickly and learn from it and improve upon it and do more research and learn from it and do more research and learn from it. And through this process, be prepared to go left and right and left and right pivot as you are learning about this. Otherwise, you could do R&D for a long time and never have anything good come out of it. I mean, we all know the story of how uh, an amazing company like Xerox had uh, developed a lot of uh, uh, amazing uh, research that never made it become successful. Or uh, Kodak uh, uh, developed so many amazing uh, uh, research that uh, none of that uh, was uh, used and effectively marketed to save Kodak. And it went bankrupt. Uh, GE had so much research but lost uh, market share in many, many different fields because it didn't get market feedback. So doing research in vacuum is crazy. Uh, even in the NGOs, sometimes I'm uh, looking at some multinational organization or non-profit uh, 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 organizations. Uh, I see that people say, well, we think this is what is needed in a so-and-so country in Africa. And my first question to them is, did you go to that country? Did you go and meet with people and discuss your idea? Or are you sitting in United States or sitting in Japan or sitting in Korea and thinking that this might be what somebody in Korea might need? Or somebody in Africa might need? Go over there and learn from them. And then continue your research and your development. I think the many the, the successful the entrepreneurs, they always saying it what you are just saying. It. It's like uh, do the kind of the lean startup kind of things and uh, the making MVP go to the customers and the testing it and got the insight and then the, to fix the something else and then do it again, do it again. So like repetition. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean. In the old style, if uh, we wanted to use a different metaphor, in the old style, uh, the generals uh, would sit around and do planning on how to move 100,000 people <laughs> to go and attack their enemy. And uh, they would spend a lot of time planning and planning and planning. A smart uh, general wouldn't do so much planning, would do some, and then would test it instead of uh, preparing 100,000 people to go there, uh, we would say, okay, 100 people, you go head on to the enemy. 100 people come on the right side. 100 come from the left side. 100 come from behind. We do a rapid prototype. Send a team, small team of scouts over there and see how is the road? Are there any bridges? 
Uh, how is uh, uh, are there any uh, ambushes? Or are there any uh, natural disasters that, that uh, maybe uh, earthquake has destroyed a uh, uh, a bridge or uh, the road doesn't exist uh, or there is a forest there? When you go and uh, look at three, four different directions, gather the data, then you adjust your plan and you say, okay, how would I divide my 100,000 troops to go and attack the enemy? And if we look at it and say, market needs to be attacked, you figure out, don't try to attack a big market. Figure out segmentation, select a specific segment, do something that is done really well and capture that. If you look at uh, Apple, Apple did not make iPhone 13 as their first consumer product. Their first consumer product was not even iPhone 10, was not iPhone 5, was not iPhone 1. Their first consumer product was iPod. iPod didn't do any telephony, didn't have a hundred different applications. It just did one thing and that was music and it did it really well. And it introduced the concept of the cloud and said, here is an iPod, which is small, and here is this thing out there called iTunes that you could download more music from it. That's all it did for a few years and learned how to do that really well and got the customers to learn how to do downloads and reliable downloads and syncing. And then a few years later, added iPhone 1. But iPhone 1 had only a few features. Mainly it had this app store, which was really the same structure as iTunes. It was just called app store that allowed other people to develop apps, to go and put it on App Store and allow people to download it, which was amazing thing because before App Store, if you were a software developer and you wanted to distribute and sell your product, you had no chance because the stores that would sell software had very limited uh, showroom capacity and unless you were Microsoft or Oracle or big uh, software name they would never create an inventory based on your software so App Store was an innovative product that disrupted the software distribution business and allowed millions and millions of people to become software programmers and publishers, to go and develop their software and publish it on App Store. And that's how we have over a million or two million, I don't know, whatever is the number of apps available on uh, App Store and a similar amount on the Android uh, Store. Uh, I think uh, the, the computers, laptops, changing the, our life, especially in the, in the business world. And then after the smartphone came up, actually it changed the, the more than anything else. I mean, the, it became a technology available to the, the billions of people at one time. What kind of the, the devices you are, you are you thinking? What is the next, next thing after the smartphone? What will be? I mean, the, the, what, what, what kind of the devices will coming up and then will change in our life in the next stage? Well, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, if we look at it, the development of technology in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, first, we had, uh, uh, starting with Netscape, we had uh, uh, Web 1.0. That was uh, basically uh, allowing you to combine 
some pictures and some frames and some graphics and uh, some text and create a website. Uh, then we had Web 2.0 that uh, allowed uh, uh, more videos, audios, other things come and allowed us to introduce uh, more uh, metadata uh, in there. Uh, then uh, Web 3.0 really brought a lot of metadata uh, into this uh, so that when you looked at the picture or video, you knew uh, that what was in it and you could do searches and say, show me a picture of a cat or show me a picture of a dancing a dog or uh, whatever. And uh, the search engines would find it for you. Web 4.0 brought us mobility, uh, using it on a mobile phone again, starting with iPhone that brought us uh, the web browsing uh, on uh, a phone, uh, we were able uh, to not only watch and uh, uh, see the audio, video, uh, pictures, text uh, anywhere in the world, but we could also take pictures and add uh, to this uh, big uh, web 4.0 infrastructure everywhere. And all of us started to capture things and become creators of content. It was a huge, huge uh, leap forward. A web 5.0 is going on right now is uh, the web is capturing all of our emotions uh, so that as we say that I really like this uh, song, I hate uh, this comment, uh, I enjoyed this movie, uh, I didn't like this book. As uh, we comment up and down uh, with emojis on uh, various pieces of content out there, it's all captured and Web 5.0 uh, is actually uh, amazing in uh, capturing all of the emotions of human race in there based on geography, based on time of the day, and you can do some amazing, amazing uh, searches. Where I see coming on Web 6.0 is uh, very interesting. Uh, I see on Web 6.0, the sense of smell is being added. Uh, we have seen companies uh, developing devices which are a thousand times to 10,000, 20,000 times more sensitive than the nose of a dog. Now imagine the power of that. If you have sensors who can pick up the smell of the things at the atomic level, or even better at the subatomic level, and then we can easily uh, predict the behavior of people because human beings give out different uh, smells depending on what type of uh, hormones uh, we produce and we release on uh, is it a dopamine which is a joy and a happiness or is it uh, some uh, you know uh, hormone that is uh, uh, um, showing anger and uh, showing danger or being uh, afraid. Uh, this would actually be revolutionizing. Uh, we would not have uh, the uh, big lines of security checks at the airports or at the uh, train stations. Uh, uh, we can just have these sensors pick up uh, uh, whatever is it that you are feeling and whatever it is that is in your luggage and uh, uh, you can just uh, move uh, uh, very nicely and effectively uh, do uh, uh, your business uh, very simply. Uh, this uh, Web 6.0 really is um, giving uh, a central, uh, I guess, uh, repository of all the audio, video, uh, 
takes the pictures, senses, uh, emotions, smells uh, we have. We are really creating uh, uh, an, uh, uh, a synthetic God that knows everything about uh, what we have done in the past, uh, what we are doing right now, uh, who has been good, who is not uh, so good, and uh, who is going to do something good or who is going to do something bad. Uh, it is a very interesting thing uh, that uh, rhymes with uh, many other things that uh, we have had in the past, uh, uh, the mythology that uh, was uh, organic mythology. We had a, a mythology of uh, dragons that you could ride and uh, fly everywhere and they could uh, send... Um, uh, the fire. Uh, well, we made the airplanes and we made uh, these uh, jet fighters with napalm bombs that could <laughs> do that. Uh, or we had the mythology of uh, 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 you could ride a bird or a flying carpet uh, that uh, you would sit on it and it would take you everywhere. Well, now first we made airplanes, then we made the helicopters, now with the new drones we are getting very close to make that happen. Uh, so the mythology of uh, every mythology that we have had, uh, synthetically with innovation, we are making it uh, become a reality. And uh, we have had that this uh, mythology about God, that there is a source of knowledge out there that is organic, that knows everything, all the knowledge of the world in every language, and knows what we have done and uh, who has been good, who has been bad, and what we are going to do in the future, all the knowledge of the world. Well, we are creating the synthetic uh, uh, God, the synthetic version of that, uh, that uh, is uh, Web uh, 6.0. And uh, what is very interesting to me is actually Web 7.0, that uh, uh, maybe we don't have time <laughs> to go and uh, talk about that, but. Uh, there might be a moment of a singularity for uh, the organic cloud and the synthetic cloud <laughs> come together and uh, uh, humanity would take a giant uh, leap uh, in evolution of our species towards uh, the next step. I think that there will be very interesting. <laughs> so is there uh, many companies in the Silicon Valley which is preparing this uh, web 6.0 and 7.0? Uh, uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, I stopped investing about five years ago, so I'm not uh, familiar with uh, all of the new developments that are uh, coming along. But uh, if you learn uh, certain things uh, about uh, how the universe works and how uh, the human beings have uh, four dimensions, as human beings, we have uh, the physical dimension, we have the intellectual dimension, uh, we have the emotional dimension, and we have the spiritual dimension. Uh, as you learn how the four of these work, uh, you can start uh, to reach out actually to the organic cloud and uh, know many of the things, how the future is going to change. And... Uh, you get high level of what is going to happen. And it's something that all of us uh, uh, can learn it. Uh, we call it our gut feeling. We call it uh, our intuition. Uh, in the old days, they would say, oh, uh, so-and-so person uh, uh, had a divine intervention and uh, uh, got, uh, you know, Moses got uh, the Ten Commandments uh, uh, given to him uh, and um, uh, you know it was seen as a miracle uh, but in reality if you look at it uh, every one of us uh, every minute is getting downloads and there is no divine intervention it's using our mobile phone and uh, downloading something uh, that uh, on our Samsung phone we download the music we download the weather forecast uh, we download the accident report, the traffic on, uh, report, and that's knowledge that uh, comes to us. Uh, so uh, that is uh, 
very common, but if you learn how to develop your emotional and spiritual dimension, uh, you can actually have uh, some knowledge uh, that is not so obvious uh, come to you about the future. And uh, it's something that any one of us can develop. And that is, in my opinion, uh, the basis of uh, Web 7.0. So, I mean, the in your company invested uh, the many China and the Singapore and in the Japan I think but how about the Korea I mean the, what do you think about the, the your future the relationship with the Korea well uh, as I mentioned before uh, I stopped investments five mm -hmm. years ago so I uh, global innovation catalyst we have exited all of our companies except one and hopefully that last one uh, will have a very big, nice IPO next year, and uh, uh, I will. Uh, that will be my last unicorn. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, relationship that I have had with Korea has been very close. Uh, actually, my first trip to Korea was in 1986, and at Cirrus Logic, uh, we formed a very nice, powerful uh, relationship with. Uh, uh, Samsung Semiconductor as our foundry and uh, uh, I have loved Korea for many years and uh, whenever I've been in Korea I have really enjoyed that and uh, in uh, uh, one of my companies uh, uh, that I was a uh, founding investor in called BSIM uh, we develop uh, uh, WiMAX 4G technology and uh, uh, our first partner was Korea Telecom because <laughs> we had uh, such an uh, amazing uh, relationship with them uh, and Korea was so much advanced uh, than anywhere else in the world in uh, mobile technology. So I've been coming to Korea for uh, many years now and uh, unfortunately due to COVID the last uh, couple of years it has been very difficult and uh, I would love to come again and renew the acquaintances and uh, hopefully uh, I will be uh, able to come and visit you guys uh, maybe uh, early next year. I'm uh, hoping that uh, Korea would open up to visitors and uh, I could come and uh, visit with you and uh, meet some of uh, your professors, some of your amazing achievements and your wonderful students. I will really look forward to that. Hi. That will be very lovely. I mean, the, the, just let us know the, the when you are coming to it, and uh, please give us a live speech, live le the lectures. Yeah, so the, I will prepare for that. And uh, the I next one is uh, you are you are nowadays uh, the traveling a lot for the kind of the the working with the UN. And uh, can you can you tell us about the, your activity nowadays? Well, uh, with uh, UNICEF, uh, I have uh, uh, these projects for uh, helping a uh, 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 new generation. Uh, uh, the UNICEF has a very interesting program that uh, for the first time is not just uh, uh, working with uh, children uh, up to age 18, uh, but it is working with youth uh, from... Uh, age uh, say 15 to uh, 25 and uh, the big problem that uh, they have seen on this is uh, uh, how to uh, create jobs of future for them uh, so i have been an advisor to unicef innovation labs and also i'm very interested in unicef's uh, uh, giga project that has uh, spun off uh, or is spinning out of uh, uh, UNICEF that is uh, looking to use uh, low orbit satellites to provide uh, low cost or free uh, connectivity to all of the schools all over the world. Uh, so those are two of uh, very nice projects that uh, I really like. Uh, and uh, at uh, Global Innovation Catalyst, as I said, our big project that takes all of my time is how to help create 10 million uh, jobs of future innovation jobs uh, for the young generation and uh, uh, really help teach uh, the experiential learning method to many different universities, many different institutions so that young people learn 
by doing things, by experimenting rather than uh, just uh, uh, listening uh, to lectures. Okay. Uh, in, in, in Christ, uh, I'm teaching the Lean Launchpad, which I learned from the Steve Blank. And uh, the, we, are oh, we, are, yeah, we are teaching the, the, our the, the College of the Business people using the online uh, startup, the, uh, actually the execution plan. So Wonderful. The, yeah, so that's we, the kind of innovation that we need in education. Christ uh -huh. is very much ahead of that. So the, hopefully the, I can introduce uh, some of the, our the platform to you and then you can utilize in those things for the, the teaching the people, young people. Absolutely. The startups. We love that. Okay. Absolutely. We love that. Love uh -huh. to learn from your experiences and uh, work together. Yeah. That would be lovely. Uh -huh. So, I mean, the, I think uh, the, the, hopefully you can give us uh, our guides to the professors and the students and alumni, which is uh, looking for the startups. They wanted to, they have uh, brilliant ideas and they wanted to start some companies. So you can give me the, some advice for them, the, what, what well, they have seems, to do. Yeah. It seems to me like uh, you are up to a uh, great uh, uh, work already. You have done uh, some amazing uh, job and uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to see how uh, uh, in my uh, hopefully soon trip uh, to Korea, we could work together and uh, take some of the knowledge and know-how that KAIST has uh, to uh, developing world and uh, make uh, uh, the lives of many people better by uh, uh, using the technology of KAIST and the entrepreneurial uh, methods that uh, you are t uh, helping your students uh, experience uh, to become a, a global force for good. Okay, so I think uh, the, 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 I think there are no more questions is coming from it. So the, I, I really appreciate the, your speech today, and uh, I really working to, to looking to, to see you in Korea, and then the, please uh, the, let us know when your your next trip to Korea. Okay. Absolutely, and I will warn you in advance, I love Korean food, uh, so be prepared uh, to take me to very nice oh, Korean yeah, restaurants. Sure. Don't, I, don't I worry about that. I absolutely love Korean food. <laughs> I love to see you again, okay? So okay. thanks for your time, and I, you I, the, the, again, I, I really appreciate your participation for our forum. So the, hopefully thank you, you can... and thank you to all your students and professors. Love you all. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh -huh. So hopefully we can invite you next next year too. Okay. Absolutely. Look all right. forward to that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Bye okay. Bye bye. bye. Okay. So the, we had the, the second session today, and uh, hopefully the, you guys can join the next next time. It's the third session is with the Steve Blank who is the, the creator of the Lean Startups. So the, the, in the next Tuesday, the 9.30, I would like to see you guys again. Thank you very much.
Thank you.